recipe formulation is one of the key aspects of becoming a good home brewer. Especially when you get into doing all grain, you kind of have to make a recipe. And at some point, you stop taking things off the internet and just build your own. So today I have Aaron Bandler on the show, and we're going to talk about how we create and formulate our recipes on homebrewing DIY. recipes and taking good notes are two of the key fundamentals of making great beer. This is one of the first things that you learn when becoming a new brewer. I started taking notes on a sheet from my extract kit and then quickly moved to brewing software. I've tried many different types of brewing software and then I found Brewfather. This is the one piece of software that you need for recipes and very detailed brew day notes as well as fermentation notes. Brewfather also integrates with some of the topics that we discuss on the show like the till hydrometer, the ice spindle, and ferment track. You need no other piece of software than Brewfather. One of the best parts of Brewfather is that you can try it for free. All you need to do is head to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer, and click on the Brewfather banner to sign up for free today. Once again, that's homebrewingdiy.beer, and sign up for Brewfather today. Keeping a clean brewery is the key to making great beer that doesn't get contaminated. Do you use a glass or plastic carboy for your fermentation? Did you know that getting your carboy clean can be tough, especially removing the cruisin ring? Even with traditional carboy cleaning tools, it can take a lot of time and not get your carboy completely clean. Well, today there's a new tool that can easily clean your carboy and do it fast, and that tool is called a scrubber ducky. Scrubber duckies are a new magnetic carboy cleaner that are easy to use and get the cleaning results required in brewing. Drop a magnetic scrubber into your carboy and be able to scrub away all of the grime in that hard to clean cruisin. They are no match for scrubber duckies and you can get yours today at scrubberduckies.com. Once again, head over to scrubberduckies.com. Have you ever wanted to make a podcast? Do you have a subject you want to discuss with listeners? Do you even know where to start? Well, if you want to make a podcast and you want to get started now, I could not recommend Anchor enough. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use right from your phone or computer. Creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. And you can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Hey, look, I shopped around for a place to post my podcast and Anchor was the easiest, most streamlined experience you could ask for. So if you're looking for a place for your new podcast, Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Once again, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome back to Homebrewing DIY, the podcast that takes on the do-it-yourself aspect of homebrewing gadgets, contraptions, and parts, this show covers it all. On today's show, we're talking about recipe formulation. I have Aaron Bandler on the show. He, if you remember him from episode two, he's actually my next door neighbor. And he joined me today because we brew together a lot. And we wanted to discuss how we both address the way that we build our recipes and the the factors that we have in place and all of the things that we take into account when we create them. So uh, it's going to be a really fun conversation. And we'll even talk to Aaron a bit about his new brewing system that he's building. So pretty exciting episode for today. 
But first, I'd like to thank all of our patrons over at Patreon. It's because of you that this show can come to you week after week. And you just have to head over to patreon.com forward slash homebrewing DIY. You can give it any amount. I am currently only have two spots left. Once we hit 20 patrons, we're actually going to stop. The $1 gets access to the RSS feed. And so... Get your chance right now. Go over to our Patreon page, and if you give it $1, you'll get access to our ad-free RSS feed plus a set of homebrewing DIY stickers. So check that out and give at any amount today. That's patreon.com forward slash homebrewing DIY. Another way to support the show is by writing us a review. You can head over to our review page on Apple Podcasts. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts right now and you're using your phone, just scroll to the bottom. There's a star rating right there. Give us a five-star rating. Give us some feedback. Let us know. And it helps others find the show. That's a great way. Another way is to head over to podchaser.com. That's a, a very cool website. Think of it as the IMDB of the internet and at least for podcasts. And so they actually do reviews there as well. So podchaser.com is a great place to review your favorite podcast. And another way to support the show, this new service that we're trying is called coffee and that's ko fi.com. If you head over there, you can give a one-time contribution. And I want to actually thank a couple of our supporters right now. So I have a new patron supporter. That's Rob Rogers. Thank you very much, Rob, for your support. It really, really, I really appreciate it. Your your monthly support will definitely help us get to some of our goals. I currently have a goal right now where I'm trying to buy a new mixing board to help improve the sound of this show. And that is going to get me closer to it. I also want to thank Gabe. He actually gave us a coffee. He, he bought us a beer on coffee. That's kind of how it works. And he went over and bought us three beers. So thank you very much, Gabe, for your support as well. The last way that you can support the show is you can head over to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer, and you can use our sponsor link. So if you use the link for Brewfather or Brew in a Bag, you can actually support the show. Your prices don't change, but they know that we sent you and they give us a little bit of a kickback there. So head over to homebrewingdiy.beer and use our sponsor links. A couple of announcements for the show. Obviously, we are going to have our June Brewers Roundtable. We have Brian Rabe from Low Oxygen Brewing. He's going to be joining us this month and doing our roundtable. Think of it as a live stream. It's going to be a really good time. That's on the 25th of June. Head over to homebrewingdiy.beer. Click on the events tab and sign up today. It is no cost to you. And if you're a patron, we'll actually take a recording of that and we will give it as a patron-only bonus episode. One thing, though, I am going to release a bonus episode next week. You're going to get one on Tuesday for all listeners. And that episode is going to be last month's Brewers Roundtable. The reason I'm releasing it is I, I want more people to attend. And I think that if people who listen to the show get a chance to hear it, they might actually think that it was a pretty cool thing and, and we might get some more people to attend. So just keep an eye out on Tuesday. You will get a bonus episode of homebrewing DIY that will go out to all of our listeners. And then you'll have your normal release that happens on Thursday. So pretty exciting stuff happening over here at homebrewing DIY. I got a bit of feedback this week, so I'm going to read it out. So Mike Weatherill wrote to us and he said, for anything that's really sensitive to oxygen, like a New England IPA, pales and Belgians that ferment in a bottling bucket, you can lift it from the front edge with a two by four. So basically he sent me a picture of this and he has a bottling bucket that he puts a two by four under it and kind of lifts it back. And what it does is that the trub, the trube, and the yeast cake actually get, get stacked towards the back of the fermenter. And then the nozzle stays wide open for him to go in and bottle. So at bottling, he doesn't rack into another vessel. And he can then, instead of opening his fermentation bucket and adding sugar into it to get it ready for bottling solution, he's taking a single sugar cube into each 12-ounce bottle. It e equates to about 2.4 uh, CO2 volumes. And so 
that that seems a little bit that seems about right and then you open the nozzle and pour against inside the glass and then you fill on top of the cap and fill it all the way up and then cap immediately for those that can't force transfer this is a dream and he sent me some pics for evidence and i will actually send you I, I will actually upload his picks to the show notes so that you can check it out. Very, very cool stuff, Mike. And thanks for the tip. So any of you that are bottling out there, you know, you can just kind of push the, the true back towards the back of your fermenter and use that as a way of clearing out your bottling bucket and just limiting some of the oxygen that gets in there. With bottling, you never really 100% eliminate it. But one thing you do know is that it, the process of bottling and the carbonation does actually eat some of that oxygen. So there, there is that. Well, I want to thank Mike for writing us some feedback. And if you have some feedback, you can always email it to us at podcast at homebrewingdiy.beer and or go to our website, homebrewingdiy.beer and click on the contact tab and fill out that form. And I will love to read your feedback on the air. Well, let's jump into this week's episode and let's talk to Aaron Bandler about recipe formulation. I'd like to welcome Aaron Bandler over to the show. He is a good friend and also my next door neighbor. And uh, we both homebrew together a lot. And uh, he is joining me today to talk about recipe formulation. What is up, Aaron? Hey, um, not much. Just uh, look, I'm happy to be back on the show after a little while here. I know you were all you were on the show all the way back in episode two, and now you're on episode number forty one. So it has been wow. a while. Wow, that's incredible. Can you can you believe I'm at forty one episodes? It's kind of my mind. I'm, I'm very impressed, you know, and I and I I um I have uh, I've been following along. Obviously, not not uh, I ha- I have I can't can't say I've listened to all forty one episodes, but I've been enjoying following along with some of the progress and seeing how things are developing with the show. So it's been a lot of fun. I'm glad I get to live across the street and uh, learn by diffusion all the things that all the great things that you learn from your guests, of which I'm honored to be one. Awesome. Uh, Let's talk about your new beer system you're building right now. You're, you're going electric, right? I am going electric. I am, I'm, I'm going, I'm going off the grid here. I am. My wife and I had a roommate for the first year that we lived in our house And then we, during that time, I decided to install a solar system through a provider. And so based on the one year of utilities that they asked for, they built me out a system. And then we no longer have our roommate. So now we only have two of us in the house. So we're overproducing electricity with our awesome new solar array. And I figured, why not put all that power to work? So I'm going electric. And you're using a brew block system. Is that right? I'm trying to. I'm working on it. I have I have some of the parts. I've been playing with it, but that's the goal. I'm gonna have a. Uh, I'm gonna set up a, um, a brew box powered system to do a single vessel brew in a bag for a five gallon batch and a dual vessel rims for a ten gallon batch, and also do my fermentation fridge. So one 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 controller for both of those applications. That's uh, going to be quite the setup. And, and for those of you that don't know what BrewBlox is, uh, BrewBlox is actually the current iteration of the original Brew Pie. So Brew Pie started off on the Arduino, is now run off of the Spark. I think they're on the Spark version 3 is the, is the, the name of the current model of BrewBlox. And they've basically, well, it's really Elko is his name over in i believe he's in sweden netherlands yep netherlands netherlands and he has now moved it to being a full-on brewing system and changed the microcontroller from the arduino moved it to the spark and so the spark has more memory and can take more uh i guess could could basically is, is when you're writing the actual code actually has more storage space for the for the base code so it can do more and uh he can now do things really cool, like you can run a mash and do a PID for mashing temperatures, and you can also still use it for fermentation, which the brew pie is super rock solid. That PID works really well. I, I Like I said, I use Ferment Track, and that was the episode that you were on, is for Ferment Track. And 
Ferment Track uses that same PID and it is rock solid as well. So very, very cool. I we're gonna have to have you back on the show when you get that system up and running and talk about what you did to build it and uh, maybe some of the challenges you had. Yeah, well, currently I'm way I feel like I'm in way over my head, so I'm sure it'll be a great episode when we eventually get there. <laughs> Maybe, maybe you'll have a few disasters to talk about. I just, I, you know, my, I feel like it, I talk about my disasters every week. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, no. You know, I, I, I'm trying to do it right with the proper uh, circuit protection, and at least, you know, hopefully, any disasters I have will not be truly disastrous. You know, I'll have the right uh, electrical infrastructure. That's part of why it's taking so long, as I'm really doing it from from the ground up, trying to do it right with the proper safety in mind. So. Uh, but of course, all that all that safety adds layers of complexity and a lot of expense. <laughs> exactly. So, anyhow, well, I I wanted to bring you on the show because you and I both write our own recipes for for beers. We don't rely heavily on pre built recipes. So, for example, you and I are both on a journey to perfect the New England IPA. I think that is kind of our <laughs> our main goal right now, which is surprisingly when you think of the base ingredients in that beer a it should be a pretty simple beer it is actually a very i think a difficult beer to actually master it's one thing yeah go ahead sorry it's one thing to make one it's another thing to make one well right i completely agree and i actually have a lot of respect for the commercial brewery i have i have a newfound respect for the commercial breweries that are doing it well i definitely like a year ago was kind of writing off the style as like uh uh, a trend and um now i can confidently say on this this as the uh summer season came around i was like really craving a juicy ipa and um i've been having a hard time getting the recipe down for sure so uh it definitely a lot of skill there yeah, it's it's a lot of skill, and it, and there's it, I I I call it my finicky beast because it's I can get I would say most of the components there, but at the homebrew scale, I still struggle to get it to be a consistent beer that is is at the right quality that I want. I'll nail it once, go to do it again, and then I am not there. So. I, I think I'm in the process of I'm going to have to make the same recipe of New England IPA probably 10 or 15 times until it is <laughs> just dialed, right? Times like this, I'm glad I live across the street from you. Because <laughs> you get to drink all 15 of those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, but when we're talking about recipe formulation, I, what I wanted to talk about today was just at least my personal a- approach to recipe formulation and you're also kind of on your journey of, of figuring out how to build recipes. And to me, when I think of building a recipe, I really want it to be as simple as possible. I think that when I first started homebrewing and I first went all grain, I would look at online resources. I had the brewing classic styles book, which I still would recommend if somebody was starting out building their own recipes, this is a good start where you where where like you would sit down and say hey i want to make a vienna lager you would go to brewing classic styles it's got a great base recipe that's going to do the job right Mm -hmm. and it's a good place to start and then you're going to tweak from there to kind of make it your own but what i've i've come to realize is that a lot of recipes tend to be overly complicated, especially when you start do, trying to do clone recipes. So you'll go online, find a, a clone recipe for, let's say, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, and you're going to try to recreate the that from really large-scale versions down to a homebrew scale. And sometimes what's going to happen is that you're going to be putting in ingredients that might not really... W- scale well down to the size that we do and what i mean by that is you might end up trying to have you know 0.2 ounces of like 15 different things to try to hit the the right kind of recipe and when i when i design a recipe it doesn't need to be that hard would you would you agree with that i i definitely agree with that yes yeah and so for me it's it's something where when i when i approach a, a recipe now i try to do things in is is 
I would say as large of increments as I can, right? So for example, when I'm doing base malt, I like to keep my base malts to full pounds if possible, right? I, I think of it as like when, if I were a, a brewery, I wouldn't think of my recipes in the, the, in pounds, I would think of it as bags of malt, right? So if sure. you're using, you know, uh, 50 pound sacks of malt and you're going to go brew three or four barrels or 30 barrels, you're going to put, you know, this many sacks of malt and you're going to try to keep them in whole units versus, you know, going out and saying, Hey, I'm going to do this with, with, uh, you know, 150 pounds of base malt and, you know, 13 ounces of this like weird malt in the middle of it. So to me, it's, I, I try to do the same thing when I'm building homebrewing recipes. And so when I start with a base malt, I try to keep things in whole pounds if possible. So the idea would be, let's say I'm going for a beer. Uh, I do brew in a bag and I'm shooting for around a 1050. I'm going to try to hit somewhere between 12, 10 and 12 pounds of base malt, depending on the malt. And it's going to get me close to there, right? And and from there, I want to then, if I'm doing other specialty malts, I try to keep my my specialty malts as few as possible, right? I, I don't want to have a, a, a gigantic wide array of specialty malts. I want it to, if, if I'm going for a specific style, I want to use the least amount of specialty malts to actually get that style as possible so that I don't overcomplicate the recipe. So that's really like my general approach to when I'm thinking about building a, a beer recipe. What does your approach look like in, in when you're creating your own recipes? Yeah, well, that's, you know, I, I, I have to say it's quite similar. But um, one of the things that I have been paying attention to, uh, especially because I've been tweaking my system and I've been planning a new system as well, is that um, a lot of w- one of the reasons it's very difficult as an all grain brewer to actually like nail a recipe that you found on the internet. Like you can go diet, you can you can go get all your ingredients to the tenth of a pound or whatever based on whatever complicated recipe you're trying to clone. But that recipe is based on that system and it's going to have its mash efficiency and all of its, you know, targets are based on a specific system. And there's a pretty good chance that your system or my system isn't going to match that. So, um, that's, that's one reason I've kind of thrown the book out on, um, on trying to copy recipes um, completely. So one of the things that I do that I've liked to do, I've, I've been looking into um, more styles. I've kind of broadened my approach to say, like, instead of saying, I'm going to make this beer, it's like, I'm going to make this style. And so actually one of the things I have a hard time with is naming my beers because I just name them things like Kolsch <laughs> because that's really <laughs> what I'm, what I'm going for is just like the style Um, and so, but the thing about that approach is that it has kind of freed me from the, like making this specific thing. And so I've, what I tend to do is I'll do a, a a decent amount of research on a specific style. Um, not a ton, but I, I want to get a feel for like which ingredients are common to the style. Um, and I'm still kind of learning my way around like specific types of malt, and like what adds, what, which malts add which character. So I'll do some research and I'll find like, okay, these are the typical malts that you'll find in a Kolsch. Uh, and then somebody will say, oh, well, if you're a, a home brewer, then you should add a half pound of acidulated malt for this reason. And I'll, you know, that, that, that might be something I would take into consideration. Um, and so the, um, I find, I think there's a, there's a resource that I use. I believe it's craft beer and brewing. I can't remember exactly. There's a kind of a series online that you can find that's, it's like brew your best or make your best X style. And they've kind of like boiled down recipe formulation to specific styles. And they'll be like, if you want to brew your best Kolsch, you should have like these components to it, uh, in terms of ingredients and also process as well. But, um, the, um, that I find that to be helpful because they'll, they, their guidelines tend to be non-specific to, you know, not, not super specific to, um, a specific, uh, individual recipe, but they will be broader to the style. And so it helps me, I'll look at things like percentages and I'll be like, your malt bill should be at like 60 to 80% Pilsner and five to 10% Munich. And, 
um, and kind of give you a range of percentages. And then that the pr- the percentages is a better place for me to start for planning a recipe for my system and my efficiency um, and things like that. So I can get to my I can I can put it work with percentages a little bit easier so I can figure out where I'm going to land uh, and I can tweak the amounts uh, in you know proportionally until I can understand a bit better where that's actually going to land me. And then, as you said, what I'll do is I'll kind of start with percentages. I'll say, OK, I want 75 percent of this, 10 percent of that. And I'll um, kind of add it all up and then tweak the numbers, tweak the poundage until I get the target numbers that I want. And then I use Brewfather for my recipe. And then I'm looking at Brewfather and it says, okay, you need 12.123 pounds of Pilsner malt. And I look at that and I say, no, no, that's 12 pounds. So um, I, uh, I go ahead and round it all off after I establish the rough percentages and the rough amounts. Yeah, I, I use Brewfather as well. And I also like I prefer when I look at a new style to have percentages as well. I think that percentages, especially when you're going from a commercial recipe or a general style down to a homebrew scale, percentages will work. They do a great job. Yeah, yeah, I, it's good. I, and it, it and it kind of frees you from the um the efficiency constraints of whatever system you're brewing on. I, that was something I didn't quite understand as a new all grain brewer was that like, um, I didn't, I, I, you know, I wasn't really paying attention to tracking my efficiency. And so, um, I would, I would copy recipes. I, I, I would look for clone recipes and I would copy those. And, um, I would typically be like th- there's there was no easier way to be disappointed in my own beer than by trying to copy somebody else's. I found once I stopped trying to copy other people's beer, I started liking my own beer a lot more. Um, <laughs> that, that, I mean, that's true because I was always I was always like wanting it to taste more like the thing I thought it was supposed to taste like, and um, uh, that was kind of like trying to co- copying the recipe exactly, but on a different system. You're like just never. It's just never going to happen. Um, so that was a lesson. Yeah. And, and one thing that I like to do when I'm creating a recipe is, and this is kind of a fun thing I do when I'm, let's say I'm, I'm making beers that aren't really true to style, which I do all the time. I, I'll have specific, I, I buy malt in bulk. You buy malt in bulk. Actually, sometimes we together buy malt in bulk and, you know, I might have, what I have laying around and because I have children and things like that, I I make beers sometimes because I have the time and I don't have time to run down to the homebrew store right now. And I'm going to use what I have and make a beer out of it. And I'm just going to make something up and it may not be true to any one style, but I'm going to make this beer. And one of the tricks that I really like to do is I love blending base malts. And I think that that is something where, there's so many recipes out there. For example, American Pale Ale, it, it always starts with a lot of American two-row. You get into some crystal, and then you start throwing your hops in there, right? And so for me, it that that's great. But one way you could actually take a pale ale and really juice it up would be you kind of take that same ideal idea, but then start blending it with some base malts, right? Maybe I have a few pounds of some Pilsner laying around and I'm going to blend that Pilsner with some American two row. And that's going to give me a bit of a different flavor. Uh, have, have you ever tried any approaches like that to kind of tweak the beers and make them your own? Well, I was, I, one of the things that you said resonated with me a lot, which is buying ingredients in bulk and using what you have on hand for sure. And so I definitely like, I, I tweak recipes all the time because, you know, I, it's a lot of homebrewing, at a certain point it becomes about economics as much as about enjoyment. But like, um, early on in my home brewing journey, I wasn't really that invested in my system in terms of, I just hadn't spent very much on it. It was all, I had all the cheapest equipment, the bare minimum stuff. And then as I was kind of acquiring more gear at a higher, you know, and kind of, you know, stacking things up and, and, um, putting together a system, um, then it be, it made more sense to actually start spending money up front, knowing that I was going to be able to brew through it all. So 
that meant buying grain in bulk, that meant buying hops in bulk. And so I will many, many times come across recipes for beers that I like or beers that I want to make. And um, the hops are all different, but I can go look in my freezer and be like, okay, I have you know, these hops available. And then I can start I, that, that allows me to do research. And that's how I've been able to educate myself on like, which hops are appropriate for which styles and which hops are appropriate substitutes for other hops. Uh, that's entirely been uh, a result of me just not having the quote unquote correct hops for the recipe that I'm, that I'm doing. So, um, um, that was, yeah, that was something that you said that resonated was just kind of figuring out how to get what you want with what you have on hand is definitely, um, part of the fun and part of the process for me. Uh, and it, it, it's satisfying because at the end of the day, you hopefully make a great beer and you also save money because you've been, you're buying your grain at 80 cents a pound instead, instead of a buck 25 and you're buying your hops at 20 bucks a pound instead of three and a half dollars an ounce. Um, so at any rate, does that answer your question or did I go off topic there? No, the, 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 you know, we're just talking about building recipes. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And when it comes to things like specialty molds, there are certain specialty molds though, that add particular characteristics that you kind of can't get around. Right. So like, for example, if you're looking for really, really dark, let's say you want a beer that's going to have a clean dry finish but you're you want it to be a dark beer you're kind of limited on the types of dark malts that you can use and so i think that also getting to know each type of malt and what the characteristics are of those malts is really important in understanding what you're going for in a type of beer and 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 i can give a good example of that like black patent malt is a a very, very dark black malt. If you put it in any beer, like you put like a couple ounces of black patent, you're definitely getting your beer close to black. But <laughs> it doesn't give it a very heavy, it, it's not heavily roasty, right? So for example, mm. I, I think the Kentucky Common is, is a great, beer it's a historic beer and it was actually the first beer i ever won a gold medal for back in 2015 when they first started the guidelines and you could do a historic beer with a kentucky common huh. i i submitted one i got a gold medal it was my first gold medal ever right and the congratulations thing with the, thank you and long overdue the, but <laughs> totally long overdue but the thing with the kentucky common is that when you use black patent because that is one of the ingredients or a common ingredient in it what it does is it gives it the dark color, but it doesn't take away from it being a cream ale because it's essentially a black cream ale, right? And so you still taste the corn. It still has a very dry finish. It has all of those characteristics, but you also understand that like this type of malt is going to give me that character. And I think that one of the best ways to be a better brewer and getting better at building your own recipes is getting experience with specific malts and trying to understand what those characteristics are in that malt and how they contribute individually those little characteristics so that you know the right amounts to add when you're creating your own recipes to try to hit a specific style. Uh, I, I want to use another example, which is smash beers are always a great way to figure out what characteristics you're going to get from, from hops and, and from malts and how they might play off of each other. And though smash beers tend to be pretty boring, you know, you, you make one and they tend to be kind of one dimensional. The idea of a good smash beer is to really dive into the character of a specific malt or a specific hop and be able to actually just pump up that exact character and figure out exactly what it's doing. Have you, have you ever made smash beers? And if you have, what, what, what would have been your, your experiences with them? I did. I made one. Um, it was a couple of years ago now and, uh, it turned out okay. I was still having some issues with oxygen contamination and things like that, but I do remember making one and I, I used, um, Gosh, I can't even remember what malt I use. I was looking, I was interested in hop character. I think it was a Citra. I don't even remember. Um, I, I, you know what? I did though do a, um, recently this, this past year, I did a, not a, not a smash, but I did a single hop 
IPA with some hops that were given to me by uh, a friend of mine who was working on a hop farm and he came and gave me a bunch of free hops and he was like, here, use these. And I was like, all right, well, I've never, it was triple pearl, which is not a variety that I had used before. So I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to make a uh, single hop IPA with this. And it, you know, it was a good experiment because I learned that triple pearl maybe isn't the best hop for a single hop IPA. But um, <laughs> well, one it's of the, a weird one hop. Of, it's like it's like one of those kind of. It's kind of like got that American noble characteristic, but it's like higher alpha. So it's like it's got a, a, a bit more of a bitter punch to it. But um, I would I would throw it into like an American style pilsner or something. I bet it would be good there. But um, yeah. It's, it was, uh, it was, yeah, the thing, the, it turned out interesting. Um, so anyhow. Yeah. And, and so like, for example, you and I most recently went in on a bag of Amarillo. You and I both like bought like five pounds and split it. So I had, I still have Amarillo coming out. Oh my man. I, I, I think I went through mine. I'm going to have to borrow some from you next time I need some. <laughs> awesome. I, I still probably have like a pound left. Right. So, yeah. but I, you know, you and I went through this phase where every beer we were making, was like, Oh, it's got Amarillo in it. Right. Right. But, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Cause yeah. we had so much of it. But the idea was that I made a smash beer out of the Amarillo. I, I got a, a bag of a base malt. It was actually the Viking uh, pale ale malt. I, I got a really good deal on a really big bag of it. And so I bought it. And it was a bit darker, right? So when I got it thinking, hey, this is going to be a really great base malt, and it is a great base malt. But when I actually got the bag, opened it up, checked it out, it was a little bit darker. Instead of it being that normal base malt, like three love blonde, it was closer to like a six or seven. So it was a little bit darker when you used it as a base malt. Totally fine to use as a base malt. And you still get really great conversion, but just a touch darker. And what I did is actually went and made a smash beer out of just that pale ale malt. And then I used some Amarillo and used Amarillo throughout the entire thing and made a really solid, great beer. And not to mention, it was probably the cheapest beer you've ever made. Oh, yeah, totally super cheap. <laughs> I, I, I think that beer cost me a total of about 12 or 13 dollars to make. Not bad. But yeah, not bad. Not bad. Uh, if, we, if we're going for cheap beer, definitely a, a good a good way to go. But the idea was that when I ended up making that beer, and I remember taking it to a club meeting and everybody was drinking, they're like, hey, this is a really great, easy drinking beer. And I was like, yeah, this is just a smash beer of these two things. But what it was is it was just me experimenting with my malt. And when I tend to run into a new malt I've never used before, specifically on the base malt side, I like to make a smash beer out of it, even if it's a, a small batch you know, do a two or three gallon batch. So you don't, you know, you're, you don't have to like drink five gallons of it, but it's a good way to figure out what your ingredients you are using. Once you understand how those ingredients all play together with other ingredients, cause it, you, you've kind of isolated it on its own. And then it's a good time to really start playing that into other recipes that you're working on. And so I think that one of the big keys to creating your own recipes is experience in using those ingredients in recipes and understanding how they contribute. And then at that point, it becomes a lot easier to just throw recipes together when you want to make a beer and tweak. Correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the other, the other big thing that I like to do is, is like we said at the very beginning of the show, when we were talking about perfecting a style, I, I like to make the same batch over and over and over again until I get something down. I think that that's also another key when it comes to becoming a really, really good brewer is trying to be consistent and having a recipe that is very dialed to your system that you know that if you go out there and make it, it's going to come out the way you expect it to. And if you made the recipe five times, it's always going to be the same those five times. And that is probably the hardest thing to do as a home brewer. Would, would you agree with that? I agree with that. And also I agree with that because it's hard for me because I'm constantly tweaking shit on my, sorry, constantly tweaking things on my system. So, um, I, uh, <laughs> it's like consistency is, is, is harder and harder when you refuse to keep things consistent your own, yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But the idea is that, uh, the, to, to me that that's the difference, like, 
that's the difference between a good brewer and a great brewer in my mind is somebody who can make something the same way multiple times and have it always kind of taste the same. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's a, uh, that's a challenge. And that's something I've been working towards as well with, with certain styles. Like I said, I have trouble naming my beers because like I do often repeat recipes. Um, but you know, part of the fun of having a kegerator with a chalkboard is to come up with cute names for things. But, um, I, yeah, I just keep making the same recipe. I got the same Kolsch on tab all the time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really working on my Kolsch because it turns out when it comes to lighter beer, um, styles, that's, that's kind of the one that I think that's probably my favorite of the, uh, light sessionable beers out there. So I've figured, all right, why not just make the same recipe over and over again and, and try to perfect it? Exactly. And, and, and I, I like to do a lot of that where it's like, I make the same things over and over again until they're super dialed. And then once I have that style dialed and I feel like I've got my recipe for that, that's the one I make. And that, that's at least my approach, but I'm always experimenting too. I, I, I feel like I've, because I have a, a keyser, I have room and I have enough space to have multiple beers on tap. It's, I have my go-tos and then I also have my beers I'm working on. I call them my works in progress. And, <laughs> and those are always ways that, uh, at least when I'm trying to come up with w new styles or styles that I want to try, like, for example, I'm still yet to make a Kvike beer. I know that that's, I, I actually have some Kvike yeast on the way and, uh, very, very excited about it. But those are the kind of things that, you know, once I, I know once I get my hands on that, I'm going to make a bunch of Kvike beers until I feel like I understand how to make a beer with that yeast. And, and then at that point, it's going to be another ingredient that I get to use continually through different types of beers and styles that I'm going for when I'm building out recipes. And just in time for summer, you're getting all that hot yeast. Oh man, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do one in my hot garage. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah, just just what? Because why not? Right? You have temperature. You could do a lager if you wanted to in your chest freezer out back. But you know, why do a lager in the summer when you could do Kvike at 100 degrees? Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna definitely just like throw one right in the garage and see like what happens. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> you know, I I'm I I'm interested in Kvike because I'm the most impatient brewer ever, and so I would love to be able to like have one just be done with primary in like a day or two. <laughs> they, they, I, you know, the, it is, it is said a beer. You can go grain to glass in four days. Kind of crazy. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> I'm amazing. all about it. I need to start. I, I need to get into yeast propagation so I can uh, make some economics out of that. Anyhow. Hey man, I, yeah. it's a hobby within a hobby at that I point. And, and, and I have all the stuff. If you want to come over and, uh, and borrow some, I'll, I'll let you have it. I, I have um, a full yeast lab. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm learning hobby uh, circuitry right now. So once I once I get that under control, I'll uh, I'll come do biochemistry. Too many hobbies. <laughs> so, what 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 other things like for example, if you were going to take your current status in brewing, what is the number one thing in your recipe formulation that you're, you want to achieve right now? Or what's your, what's your goal over the next six months to actually get perfected? Um, I am working on dialing in my mash efficiency. Uh, that's been something that's plagued me for a while, just because I haven't until, until two years ago when I bought my house across the street from yours, I never really brewed in the same place twice. So by therefore, like all the system kind of was always changing, like the setup was always different. Um, and then once I sort of settled here in the suburbs of Denver and um, have been able to kind of establish my system and establish like a little bit more protocol around my brew day of like where things go and how they get set up and um, just kind of achieving that consistency. Um, with that kind of comes the the improvements. It's like, you know, it's like it's like having a house. You kinda like you live in it and then you figure out, okay, like I wanna I wanna do this, I wanna fix that, I don't care about that. Um and so the um yeah, so it's kind of dialing in the system to like the um the specific 
the specifics of like where things go and how um, how how closely how well I can control the different variables when it comes to mashing and extracting and um, and things like that. So I'm I'm trying to get my I really want to be able to confidently design a recipe and and be able to know like consistently that the extraction that I am have I've built the recipe for is what's actually going to come out. I'd say I'm at about 60% right now in terms of like when my recipes hit the targets right on and when things get off. And, um, it's usually like, I, it turns out I actually haven't really had that much of a problem with mashing. It's more like volume stuff. I just get weird for whatever reason. I get weird volumes sometimes. So, um, I have had some challenges over the last year or so with, um, yeah, with just like getting, hitting those targets every single time. And so sometimes they land right on and like for, for certain styles, like the Kolsch, for example, and the cream ale and like a few styles that I've made a few times that are pr- rather simple recipes. Those ones I've had, um, a lot of success, like really hitting the numbers. And then when it comes to things like the new England IPA, where there's really high percentages of oats and wheat and other adjunct grains, like those ones are a little bit more variable in terms of where they end up. So I'm really trying to, that's part of also part of the impetus for building out the new system is to actually like try to do it right now. Now that I have the space and the time to do it, um, to actually like hit those numbers right on and be able to, to make those recipes knowing where they're going to end up. Yeah, and that does bring in a good discussion with brewing software. I think that uh, one of the big keys of creating a a quality product is making sure that your your brewing software is super dialed to your system. And for me, for example, whenever I start with a new system, one of the, and, I, and people who've been listening to the show know that Aaron bought a mash and boil. He actually bought it uh, secondhand from somebody, and I think you're now using it generally as just like a hot liquor tank. But the idea is that uh, that mash and boil I've brewed with a few times and it took me a few batches to actually get it dialed. And so the idea, but, but when I'm doing that, I try to not change any variables. I try to come up with a process that has all the variables out until I start hitting my numbers consistently. And then you add new variables because you already know that the exact variables that you have are going to. So, for example, when I put my numbers into my my brewing software, that that's actually what's going to come out of my batch. And the tweaks that I make, I actually put into my my brewing software, into my equipment profile. And so that's really, really important when it comes to hitting your numbers. So, like, for example, if you change a single thing in your profile, like, like, for example, your profile stays the same, but you change variables in your brewing process. Well, now your profile isn't correct because, for example, you change something in your equipment. And so it, the numbers you're putting into your, your brewing software are going to be different. But one of the things I think that new brewers get hung up on is the numbers in general in that they'll sit there and tweak a recipe and they'll end up with really weird amounts of different Mm -hmm. grains in that recipe trying to hit the exact number for IBUs for an IPA, right? Or trying to hit the exact gravity number uh, right in the middle for a specific, uh, you know, uh, a Kolsch, right? And so the idea is that there's ranges there and you don't have to tweak everything to be in range. You can totally, if you understand your ingredients really well, you could totally... I, I it sometimes will just throw like I don't say completely, but I don't get so hung up on what the numbers of my brewing software say as much as if I know and understand that hey, if I add this ingredient or if I if I'm a little low on the ABV because I just want a lower beer. It has nothing to do with what that number is. And so the idea is that, yeah, maybe if I'm going for a com- competition beer and it has to be within the numbers because that is what the style asks for, great. You can go that road, 
But even then, there's ranges there for a reason. It doesn't have to be smack dab in the middle of the range or on the high end of the range. It has to be, you know, I like, you know, if you like beers to be a little bit higher in ABV, that's okay. If you like them to be lower in ABV or session beers, that's okay. And so uh, not getting so hung up on what your brewing software is saying numbers wise can also help you overcome maybe some of those challenges, right? Well, and let's also not forget it's, you know, when you mentioned not getting hung up on the numbers, let's not forget a huge variable that we haven't even really touched on, which is that there's a third party here, which is your yeast and they're going to do whatever they want. And, um, and, uh, you know, I've had a IPA that was supposed to finish at 1017 that finished at 1008, you know, <laughs> like, like, like trying to, Obviously, there are things that you can do to control that. Absolutely. But um, that's something that is also that's that's you know, that's a that is a challenging variable, especially for the new brewer, um, depending on what kind of controls you do have in place. And so letting the yeast do their thing, I have found, is just really the best course. And um, try not to get too hung up on what they're doing, because um, they're really just going to do whatever they want. Exactly. And there's a lot of variables to that. It can be things like the temperature at which you ferment at. It can be, uh, it's obviously the mashing temperature, right? So for example, let's say you're going for a, uh, a beer that's going to have full body and you mash it at 147. Well, you know what? If you mash it low, it's going to go lower. It just is kind of the deal. And because it becomes more fermentable. And so understanding, you know, obviously the processes of the brewing process is, is, is key here but yes i've had that happen i i just made a beer the other day that was supposed to finish at 10 10 and finished at 10 02 i i have no idea why and, uh, <laughs> and it's uso5 and went dry yeah. as hell right yeah i mean uh, that but yeah well that that could happen right like, yes, happens, i'm sure yeah there's a reason that there's a reason that commercial breweries employ biochemists to like help them figure out their yeast and, exactly and such and their fermentation and stuff it's it's a it's it's a whole other science so exactly. um you know i chemistry was never my strongest subject neither was biology and the two together forget about it so <laughs> Well, Aaron, I I want to I want to thank you for coming on the show this week. I, I think that this was a fun discussion talking about you know at least our two approaches to how we build recipes and and basically try to perfect the beer using our our current systems. And I'm definitely going to have you back on the show when you get your brew block set up. I, I want to take pictures and have you back on because I haven't really talked about brew blocks a lot other than referencing it during some brew pie episodes. But it's definitely a system that I'm very curious about. It has probably one of the sexiest dashboards out there I've seen. It's it's pretty cool. It's like, yeah, I've been playing with the dashboard a little bit because you can set up a, a simulation uh, without having to have it actually control everything. So hopefully by hopefully I'm, I'm hoping that by sometime in July, let's see, we're recording this on June 10th. I'm hoping that by sometime in July, I'll at least have all the parts assembled and can start building the thing. Uh, I do have my new kettle and my heating element and everything. So I need to have some work to do, but, um, I'm starting to assemble parts and yeah, I'm definitely hopeful, hopeful that I'll be able to brew on it at least a couple times before the end of the summer and into the fall. So yeah, we'll uh, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a really, really cool setup. I I'm, I'm, I'm excited for you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, well, thanks for being on the show and we'll see you next time. All right. Take care. thank Aaron for taking the time to come on this week's show. It was a great conversation and it was a really good time deep diving into how we approach our recipe formulation. Another thing to note is towards the end there, I did get a bit of a click in my audio. I've had that problem a couple of times lately. I think that it has to do with my cell phone in my pocket, giving me some feedback in my cable. So I have to figure that out. But uh, yeah, well, we'll see you next week on Homebrewing DIY and check out our bonus episode. Thanks. <laughs>